Father, we come to you this morning and we give you thanks for your greatness. Just the privilege that we have of people to come together and share worship with you. We thank you for this household here, that it's so good to be back together again. And uh, as we look into your word, which is so incredible, I pray, Father, that you will uh, help me be able to be a good deliverer of this message this morning, that uh, I will be able to articulate your truth uh, with, with clarity, and uh, that you will anoint my, my lips. We pray also that you will uh, give us all ears to hear what your word has to speak to us this morning. And uh, so we thank you that we have your word that we can study like this. So we ask your blessing upon this place, and we play, pray that uh, us being here will be a blessing to you. In Jesus' name, amen. So as I said, we're taking a, a couple-week break on, on Psalms, and uh, last week Wes had, had started us in thinking about how to pray through the Psalms. The Psalms are rather interesting because they're the, the only collection and the book in the Bible, that really is man speaking to God. And that's why we can use it and we can take it and we can, we can pray them through. The Psalms have been prayed over the generations. They've been spoken and read over the generations and then they've been sung over the generations. And it's, it's just such a beautiful, transparent, I say it's like this tapestry of the human a heart and the human spirit as we, I guess, try and, and speak to a, an amazing God. I often wonder, I said, how can we as human beings that are so finite even communicate with God so great? So these, these psalms were people's just bearing their, their hearts and, and their spirits to God uh, they were developed over a thousand year period, they believe. And uh, there's about 150 of them in total. And uh, they're written by a number of different people. Uh, David was one that uh, wrote uh, over 70. I believe it was 73 that he wrote. And um, over the years, they've been collected together and been used for worship purposes. Uh, as I say, though, it's, it's just beautiful because it's, it's like this unedited um, just raw bearing uh, of the heart at times. And there's a number of different types as well we'll find as we go through uh, these next two weeks. We're just doing two of them. Um, but uh, some of them are those of, of praise, of worship, where it's one that's calling the community of, of believers to come together and worship God. Others, it's just in adoration and praise of, of what he's like, and others of thanksgiving is of what he's done. Uh, others are instructional, where they're giving insight on, on uh, pursuing God and, and uh, what God is like. And uh, then we also have um, some of those that are, are laments, and those are ones when, when life really hurts deeply, and they're just asking and pleading God for help. And these are all things that God has enabled us to have in his word. So when we're in those low times, it doesn't mean that we're ungodly people. When we're crying for God's help, that doesn't mean that either. But it means that we are really approaching the creator God that wants us to approach to him. Excuse me for a moment. So... Just quickly, we're going to do a quick background of David, because David, uh, the two that we're looking at this week and next week are, are ones that were written by David. So i like us to grab the context of, of where, where it comes from, this, this person that's writing these things, and, and what was the environment like. So uh, David, uh, where he comes on the scene, we'll let you know where that is, but, but he's been raised by his parents that were Jewish people and obviously godly people. And they did what was advised to those in Deuteronomy that says, talk about these things, these things that God has done for us as people, his people over the generations. Pass them on, talk about his word, talk about his law, pass them on to each generation so we don't lose it. And so David comes onto the scene already understanding that God is the creator of everything. 
and, uh, and David sees this, and he marvels with it. He knows the background of how God called Abraham, and we have the, uh, the patriarchs, the Abraham, the Isaac, and Jacob, and all those sort of things. He knows about the story of Joseph and the way that the, the Israelites ended up uh, being led to, to Egypt, and then were in, in bondage, and he knows about God's incredible divine deliverance as he takes them out of that messy, messy thing. But he also knows that, that through that time, God's people have been unfaithful because he also understands the history that we're given in the book of Judges. And that's just an up and down and up and down of faithfulness and unfaithfulness, falling into trouble, calling for God's help, and then repenting once God provides the help, and then they go back into the pit again. It's up and down and up and down. And we're entering the scene close to David now, uh, but prior to that, we have a man named Samuel that comes on the scene and a, and a man named Saul. Now, before that, the end of Judges, there's a passage that I, I think is just a, a sad statement, but it was a true statement. And it says that at this time, Israel had no king and everybody did whatever they wanted, you know? So we, we have this, this history of sometimes spiritual anarchy that's going on in God's people. So enter Samuel, and Samuel, during that time, as we come into First and Second Samuel, uh, the book of First and Second Samuel, uh, at the start there it mentions that the word from the Lord had been very rare at this time. So Samuel comes up as a young boy, being brought up as as a uh, in the temple. And uh, he's under the tutelage of Eli and his sons, which were just terrible. And so we see that, that, that through this time, the history doesn't look good with Israel. Again, there's this up and down, this up and down. And then God uses Eli to, to have a time of revival. So there is a, a time of revival. So Dave comes on the scene at this, during this time, of Eli. So Eli is kind of one generation, Saul's the next generation, and then David's underneath it. So that's kind of the, the, the ballpark age group of these guys. So Eli could be the grandpa, um, Saul could be the father age group, and then David's this, this young guy. So how does David come onto the scene? I think this is kind of interesting because um, David doesn't even come on the scene until he's about 15. So what's he been doing through this time? Well, we find out that, that David has basically been in the fields taking care of sheep. And uh, night and day, that's what he does. And uh, the way that God brings him on the scene is pretty interesting. Number one, David is the uninvited guest of honor to a party. Get that? <laughs> it's a party for him, and he's not even invited. So um, Samuel was told by God to go to Bethlehem and call this group of guys out from a family, and he's going to anoint someone as king. And so David was the insignificant one. After all these brothers came through, uh, God kept telling Samuel, no, that's not the one, that's not the one. And then he says... Uh, to the father, he says, do you have any more sons? He says, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, well, we got the youngest one, the ins insignificant one. The young one. He's the one out the field. He's not that big. These guys are big. These are the ones we want leading. But, but there's this insignificant one out in the field. Get him here. So they hurry to get him to the party that was supposed to be for him. And at that point in time, God has Samuel anoint him to saying that you are going to be king. Now, I think it's interesting at this time because what does he do? David goes back out of the field and continues to shepherd. But, you know, I, I think if it was someone like us, we'd probably have our cards made out, start delivering them out. We'd have the placards. We see the politicians getting ready now. They've got all their stuff out. You know, I'm going to be the next this, and I'm going to be the next that. But David just goes back out into the field and shepherds. Kind of in obscurity. He's about 15 years old at this time, and it's not for a couple of years that he gets now brought back on the scene again. So we have the uninvited guest, and the next one is um, a real upset king 
compliments of God. God puts an evil spirit on Saul and, and just makes him just irate, and he just doesn't know what to do with himself. And somebody says, oh, yeah, there's this guy who plays really nice music. Oh, bring him here. And I'm sure that at the time, it would be such that, that David would be kind of behind a curtain or, or not right beside Saul saying, okay, let me just chill you down here a bit. But uh, anyways, we find that, that he's now brought into the temple place or to the kingdom, the, the, the place where the head honcho is. So he's just introduced there. And he is able to calm Saul down. And what does he do after that? He still goes back back into the field, and he shepherds. And his third introduction brought in is a few years later when he, I like to say it's like a lunch delivery. He really is just going to deliver lunch to his brothers who are the big tough warrior guys. And uh, that's where he has his encounter with Goliath. And uh, we find that Sam is saying, who, or, or uh, Saul is saying, who is this guy? Okay, this is the guy that's been singing him to sleep at night, but obviously the way the king is, is like, I'm not even paying attention to who these servants are. You know, it would be like somebody at a restaurant that doesn't even pay an attention to the server that comes, yeah, yeah, thank you very much, just put it right there. And you know how that can be. And so here it's interesting how God methodically brings him into the, this, this situation. So uh, he's anointed as king, age 15. He's not even made king till he's 30. So we ask ourselves, what has happened in David's life during these 30 years to the point that he becomes king? We find he was raised in solitude, in obscurity, out in the mountains, just taking care of the, the sheep. And then we also find later in his life that he spends 10 to 15 years of his life running for his life. And so it's through these times we see that, that, that David becomes intimate with God and begins writing these psalms. So you could picture him familiar with the mountains there in, in the Jerusalem area, in Bethlehem area, and uh, looking into the stars at night and just finding the wonder of God and seeing the sky during the day and really appreciating the wonders of God. So the psalm I, that we're going to take a look at today is Psalm 19. So if you have your Bibles, please get them out. Because this is going to be our text for today. Psalm chapter 19, and I'm going to read through. Uh, today, we're, we're just going to rip it apart together. Uh, I like to do this as if we're just sitting across the table in the house um, discussing God's word. And so that's how we're going to do this. Um, as I was looking through and, and working it, there's kind of three sections we're going to be looking at where we're... David observes and compliments on the wonder of God just through creation. And, and then he compliments or, or, or talks about the way that God speaks to us through his word and just what a wondrous thing that is. And then there's a time of reflection of man. So I'm going to read this to you. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Now day after day they pour forth speech Night after night they display knowledge. There's no speech or language where their voice is not heard. Their voice goes out into all the earth, their words to the ends of the world. And then he kind of draws a, paints a picture of it that, that he just kind of describes this majesty. He says, in the heavens, he's, it's like he's pitched a tent for the sun, which is like a bridegroom coming forth from his pavilion. It's like a champion rejoicing to run his course. It rises at one end of the heavens and makes its circuit to the other, and nothing is hidden from its heat. This is just an awesome description of God. And you know, when I first read it, I thought, yeah, so I, I go through the first part, and I see that it says, yeah, so the heavens are just telling us about God. But there's two words in there that sound similar, but have a little different meaning to them that just kind of really make this beautiful and brings it to light even more. I'm, I'm not a Hebrew scholar by any stretch of the imagination, but I love looking up the, the meanings and the terms of the original words. And so these two words are safar and uh, magad. Visual crutches, here we are. 
So one means to say, we would like to introduce this person. Introducing. And the other is to make it very, very conspicuous. You know how sometimes we want to be inconspicuous, so we just kind of slip in and slide the back. We don't want anybody to notice. Well, this is the opposite. So I, I'm thinking of, uh, I'm sure most of us have seen the old Rocky movie. Dun, 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 you know, when the music's building, the building, and he's coming and he's running up these stairs, and he's, it's like introducing. There's this massive fanfare to say, he's in town, you know. And so this is kind of what, what, what this is saying. It, it's like this incredible fanfare and production that says, we want to introduce something. We want to bring your attention, ladies and gentlemen of the earth. God. Interesting, on the news recently, uh, I got to read this to you. And uh, I heard on the news and then I looked it up. It says, the mystery at the heart of the Milky Way has finally been solved. Oh, I love it when scientists say that. This morning, a, a simultaneous press conference Around the world, the astronomers of the Event Horizon Telescope reveal the first image of the Sagittarius A. This is a supermassive black hole at the center of the Milky Way. It's not the first picture of the black hole this collaboration has given us, but they have revealed, uh, and it goes on to talk about Sagittarius is our own private supermassive black hole that our galaxy revolves around. Got that? They're introducing this. They're looking at this marvelous wonder. Now, I think it's pretty fascinating because I think God plays head games with, with us humans sometimes. And I think in this case of the, the space race, of, of trying to get out there and really explore space, which, like, we haven't scraped the surface. It would be like moving one speck of sand to the next speck of sand from here to Montreal but they feel we've really accomplished something. But I, 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 you know, some people might think that, well, it's all conspiracy though too. But I think if you think that, we're really underestimating God because this seems to keep showing what he's allowing them to see. You wanna see something bigger? I'll let you develop a little bigger telescope, a little stronger lens. I'm gonna let you get some uh, satellites out there. They're gonna send you back some more marvelous pictures of what I've made. Got it? And But man is looking at it as if, like, we're going to discover, you know, where we came from. Maybe there's life. They're, they try and make up ideas, and they're really missing the mark. The mark is, it's saying, it's declaring God. The purpose of it is declaring God. Where it came from is declaring God. And the massive size of it declares God. Because he can do that. But yet man likes to try and do these different thoughts and, well, we'll discover how this is made and how it runs and what's going to happen with it. But they've really, man has missed the point. So let's get back to this passage again. So, so we see that, um, that the heavens are, those two words again, Safar and Magad, Magad. Yeah, I'm real good, aren't I? He's a scholar. <laughs> and it, now, how are they doing this? How are they declaring? And then it goes on in the next verse. It says that day after day, it's like an unrelenting thing. It's just constantly going on. We were over just recently uh, babysitting our, our grandkids, and we put them to bed, which is all good grandparents do that. And then the neighbor's dog. And apparently he does this thing all night. Constant, unrelenting. And this is the way this is doing this. This, this sky, this universe, uh, what we see is constantly, unrelentingly proclaiming God's wonder. There's another word in there that says that it's doing it unrelentingly in a very specific way. And the term is nabo, which means to bubble up, and I loved it, or belch forth. So, so have any of us, you know, had times when we've had some food that just, you know, was percolating in there, and in some way it had to explode out? And it's like you cannot hold it back. It just has to come. 
And this is what it's saying. It cannot hold back the glories and the wonders of God. It's just rather forcefully, day after day, belching forth and screaming out the wonders of God. Now he continues to go on. He says, there is no translated needed. Notice, no voice or language. It's just like nobody needs to explain it verbally. You just look at it and you've got to marvel at it. There's no translation needed. And then he goes on to make that beautiful visual that he talks about the sun. I mean, that's just awesome. And at that time, they didn't even know. They didn't have the telescopes to see what we see today, which is just even more amazing and wondrous. The problem with this is, is that although God's presence is there and visible, somehow it doesn't facilitate relationship. Remember in Romans chapter 1, it talks about the way that God has made it very, very clear to mankind from the beginning of all the things that he's made. But man became futile in their thinking, and they exchanged the wonder and the glory of him for things that they made. And therefore, they just digressed. And there's this spiral, this decline. So it doesn't facilitate that because... God has just only communicated through this, his existence, which we cannot deny. In Psalm 19, David did a wonderful part with that. And then he moves on to the next passage that I think is just an incredible way at depicting his love for God's word. So we're going to read that section now. It says, the law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ordinances of the Lord are sure and altogether righteous. They're more precious than gold, much pure gold. They're sweeter than honey than from the honeycomb. And by them, your servants warned, and in keeping them, there's great reward. So it's interesting. As, as I had looked at this, I kind of broke down two little, I made, made two little lists. And uh, I, I marked them in, in uh, my Bible. And so first of all, the words used, he loves God so much, he covers it with a number of different words. And uh, he talks about, in, in my passage, the, the, the law, the testimony, the precepts, and the commands. And sometimes we can read that through and think, oh, it's all the same thing. But, you know, it, it isn't. So when I went back to it, I said, my goodness, this is amazing, the way this just unfolds and give us greater appreciation. So the first term it uses is the law. It, it means the Torah, which is God's written book. Um, the uh, Jewish people had the five first books of the Bible that was their written law, and they had the, lit the written law from God. And this is like the, the, the instruction manual, the full manual that's handed and say, this is the manual for your existence and for life. And, and I liken this one like a, a good guidance system. Nick and I were traveling recently. We went to Florida. And uh, we've had the opportunity to use different types of GPSs. It is pretty amazing. Um, we kind of like the, the maps that, that you can use on the phone, and uh, because that will bring you in just to the place that says you have arrived at your destination on the right. You got that? You know, there it is. Look there. Well, we, we, because we didn't have long distance stuff through the States, we had to use the GPS in the truck. And this was quite, quite uh, a, a little adventure because this one just wasn't a manual quite as good as the other one. Honestly, uh, you truckers will know, sometimes, you know, you get to these little towns or cities, and they've got this nice highway that swoops around so you don't have to do all the stop and start through town. So we're driving on this one. It's a fairly new one, and suddenly we look, and there are little icon is just shifting away and spinning out and doing this fishtailing. I thought I was going to get pulled over for stunt driving. But, but uh, anyways, it just didn't know what to do. It, it just was recalculating, and it was off no man's land. That was not a good manual. It was not the good GPS to get me. And other times we get some place that says, you've arrived at your destination. We're in the middle of the road. <laughs> Where's our destination? Oh, oh, it's, it's way over there. So like it's, it's 
Sometimes it wasn't even close. So this is a, f- a full manual. You know, like sometimes you'll have an assembly manual too. Have you ever done that where, um, well, you women probably haven't because you always get us guys to build things and then we don't like to look at manuals. So we'll get it almost done and we'll find, oh, step two. I should have done first because now I can't do step three to seven. You know, and, and so it's following these instruction manuals. So that's what the law is. Now, in this law, then there's also the testimonies, or uh, eduth, it says, which are admonitions, ordinances, warnings. So this is like us in our society here where we've got that. So we'll see signs that say children playing, um, unimproved road, which some guys with trucks you want to go down. And, and, and we'll have these different warnings, you know, that... Um, you know, narrowing lane ahead, or um, we'll have warnings on, on the, the news that, you know, we've got some high wind warnings coming up. So, so God's word in his overall book provides these warnings as well in life. And then there's the precepts. And this means a general rule intended to regulate behavior or thought. Now, this would be now more like us having speed limits that say these are the limits that, that we want to Keep going here. Stop signs. We want to stop at these stop signs as well. And one-way traffic, you want to make sure you're going in the right direction with that. And maybe do not enter. You know, so these are, are what those precepts are. Commands are ones, and these are, are ones that command more immediate attention. You hear the ambulance sign coming behind, the fire trucks or whatnot. Get off the side of the road. Just, just get off. Let them through. These are these rules and regulations that we have that demand immediate attention. Um, uh, Other things that um, you need to have a driver's license. That's that's another one. Otherwise, you know, there's trouble. Um, uh, Another one is, is demands very immediate attention is pay your taxes. Okay. So along with these ones, then there's another, the ordinances, and these are now the customs, decisions, the matters of justice and judgments that put all this stuff together. So these are the ones that, that let us know that if you do this, these are your consequences. If you don't do this, that's your consequences. So it puts it all together, and, and David's looking and saying that, God, you've given us the, the full picture of, of this, this whole thing. And you've equipped us of how to live life. Now, in there, amidst of it, he also then says, the fear of the Lord, it talks about that is like clean and pure and really lasting. He kind of throws that in there. That's not a description of God's word, but it's just a description of how we should perceive his word. I liken it like the way that you'll see sometimes movies or pictures of guys handling nuclear material. You know, they've got all these special suits on, protective suits, and they're handling it with great care because they know if they don't, it is crazy, scary, devastating stuff. And so that same sort of thing, that we should deal with God's word in this awe and reverence this fear that we're dealing with this thing that is absolutely powerful and let's treat it with great care and respect and honor the way we deal with it because that is a pure thing for us to do. It is good, it is right, and God's word is enduring. So those are the words he uses to describe God's word and now there's the characteristics of of, uh, God's instructions. And I made another list there. And so it's another great list that he describes. And before I've read through this, and sometimes I gloss over and say, yeah, it says that, you know, God's word is is really cool. And, uh, but yet it, it just is an amazing thing that covers so much for us and gives us all we need for life. But he talks about his word now being perfect, which means complete, sound, entire in its integrity, uh, without defect, you, you get these uh, diamonds that they say this is a perfect diamond, meaning it has no flaws in it whatsoever. Trustworthy. Uh, it's established. It has full assurance. It's had a track record that you can rely on. That's one of these you can take it to the bank, you know. Um, it, you can just fully, fully lean on this. It is right, 
meaning it's straight, it's fittest, it is correct, it's upright. There is nothing wrong or improper about God's word. And it's enlightening. So it actually opens our eyes. It enlightens us to life. It goes on to say it's sure, which means it is firm, it is steadfast, it does not budge. And it's altogether righteous. In fact, it says it's completely acquitted. There is no fault in it whatsoever. Where we know our laws here, they constantly are changing. You know, we might battle some laws and for a while not like them, and five years down the road, they change them again, you know. And uh, they're constantly changing, and a law here is totally different than the law in another country. And so there's no consistency with our man-made laws. So they are not altogether right because they change them. And it talks about something to be desired. Now, I think this is kind of interesting. Just in the news recently again, another little tidbit I threw, I thought this is amazing. And this is apparently something that was desired by somebody. I don't know whether you heard that there's a portrait of Marilyn Monroe painted by Andy Worrell that just sold an auction for $170 million. And then with the fees on top, the person paid $195 million. So they, they valued this, which was a picture of a totally messed up person. What's up, folks? <laughs> what is, we got to ask, what's up with that? But it says that this is something to be desired. Much more value than, than a painting. Much more valuable. Are things screwed up in our lives? And it says that it's sweeter, sweeter than honey. And then he goes on to describe the results of God's word's effect on our lives. And it says, with God's work, it says it converts the soul. In other words, it turns back from wrong, way, wrong ways. It changes. It makes us a change. It says it makes wise. In other words, it, it gives us wisdom as to how to live life properly. Wisdom is that skill of learning to live properly. It gives joy because we know we're in God's right handling of his word and it, it just brings joy and it illuminates. It gives warning and the source of great reward. Excuse me for a moment again. So I felt we need to ask ourselves a few questions on this section. What does this say about God? What does this say about God? First of all, we know that he's an incredible creator, but now that he's actually spoken to us as humans through his word, and we even have a greater amount of it now in, in, in our century, because we also have the account of Christ and what he came to do and accomplished, where all this so far as David's talking about, is really waiting in anticipation, knowing that God has a, a plan that he's working out. So we know one thing, that, that God actually wants us to be informed. Very simple. He's written these things down. He's given us instructions because he wants us to be informed the way we were designed to. Got that? To live the way we were designed to. He's given us all that information we need. Secondly, God has our best interest in mind because everything he requests through his word is nothing but good for us. Two or three, that God is relational. He actually cares about people. He loves us enough to communicate with us. Now I think of, of two passages that that give us an indication of, of how God really, really cares for us that he's communicated. 
And one is in Leviticus 18. Leviticus 18, sometime go and read it. You know, there's a massive list of, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. So there's a massive list. Uh, a lot of it is, is, is physical lists of, of sexual things that he does not want you to be part of. But the, the big, I guess, symbols crash at the end of this is where he says, the reason is, he says is, this is the way all the other peoples have defiled themselves. Got that? These actions are all defying action, defiling actions. And God says, don't do it because these people are messed up royally. And these are the things that mess them up. So don't do it. You know, I, 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 often the, the scriptures are very, very graphic. And so this might gross you up a little, out a little bit, but I'm going to say it anyways. I, I'm sure all of us have sometime or other seen a, a little kid with their mother walking along and grabbing dog poop and putting it up to their mouth. And the mothers, don't do that. But that's what God is saying here. This stuff will defile you. It's wretched. It's filthy. Do not touch it. I love you so much. I'm letting you know. So we, we cannot be left saying that I didn't know. In Romans chapter 1, it says man is without excuse. And they've chosen to defile themselves. And then in 2 Peter chapter 1, this is a passage that uh, the men's group, we had a chance to spend some time on, and it lets us know that, that God has given us everything we need for life, living our life, and godliness. You know that? He's given us everything we need to know. And the reason it says is that we can escape the corruption, don't be defiled, leave that stuff alone, and participate in the divine nature. So we actually can do this with all the instructions that God has given us. So at this point, we're moving on, and this is where David now, he's finished taking this incredible look at God. God had who, who he is and how awesome he is. He marvels, and then he realizes how incredible it is that God has given him this word and that it is so priceless. It is just so valuable but then he has a moment he's reflecting on man. And I'd like to read this section to you. And starting in verse 12 now, he says, Who can discern his errors? Forgive my hidden faults. Keep your servant also from willful sins that they might not rule over me. Then I will be blameless Innocent of great transgression. And then he says, may the words of my mouth and meditations of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. So as David is writing this psalm out, he's writing it to God in a confession of how much he appreciates God. So we have a, a couple points in this last little section. One is a confession. And the confession is, in reflection of this awesome God, he's realizing, who can really even know when we've gone wrong? Have you ever unintentionally hurt someone? Or has someone ever been mad at you that you've done something wrong and you didn't even know it? Maybe you get the cold shoulder, maybe, I, I don't know, but, but sometimes that happens. And with us, in human beings, sometimes we can be offending God that we don't even know it. It's an unintentional thing. And David's asking this question. We have uh, an example of that in 2 Samuel, where, where David is taking these 30,000 people to go and get the ark, and they're going to bring it back to Jerusalem. And they're just all excited about this. The ark is going to be back in our place. And there's a little stumbling of the ark and a guy named Uzzah puts his hand out to, to support it and he keels over dead. Well, David was really upset with all this and they just, leave it alone, come on, let's go home. Let's, let's just move on here. And David goes home and in First Chronicles, we find out that, that David found out what, where they went wrong. They found out where the offense was. We gotta check out what went wrong here. 
oh, we did something we weren't supposed to. And so there's an example that sometimes we don't even know. Next, he has a couple requests. Request one, he says, forgive my hidden faults. Now, I think it's interesting because there's kind of two things that came to mind for me with these hidden faults. One, the hidden faults, those ones that we don't even know. So God, like, I haven't even apologized. I didn't even know how to apologize because I don't know what I did wrong. But I'm sure I've offended you some way. I don't want to do that. So please forgive me of that. And so if we go to the grave, we also realize that Christ, um, his sacrifice was for all our sins, past, present, present, and future. So if there's some that we've missed, it's, God's got it covered. You know, I still believe it's, it's good for us, good medicine when we repent and are sorry. And there's a lot of Psalms that talk about that, that uh, when we willingly are aware of some, just apologize. We do that. To our friends, our spouses, we reach something, elbow in the face. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. I didn't mean that. <laughs> you know? Um, so that's the one. And then the other is the hidden faults that we know about. And that is our secret sins. This, I like to call it our, our secret hall of shame. That we just, you know, just don't want anybody to know. And, and we've all got it. These are the ones that we are willfully hiding. And sometimes we hide them because we're more concerned about the consequences around here than we are about here, which is unfortunate because this is the most important. So that's the first request he has. Realize who of you knows their fault. God, forgive these sins. Forgive my hidden ones, the one that I'm, I don't even know about and the ones that all my friends don't know about. For, forgive me of those. And then his other request is to keep. He says that keep your servant also from willful sin that they will not overtake me. David has a realization here that he has this human nature that really somehow likes sin. And he, he realizes that he needs God's strength to even enable him to not be overcome by that. And we can all stand in, our, in those shoes, and we can admit that ourselves. And these are the ones that we get sucked into, or the ones that we just willfully dive into. And so these two things, David realizes this awesome God who's given us his word, we need his help so badly. We need his forgiveness. We need his help of restoration. And then it goes on to say that to this point, if I know this through God's intervention, if God does this and cleanses us, he says, then I will be blameless and innocent of great transgression. Now, that's not on his own accord, remember? That's under God's work, the work that God is doing in his life. So through man who seeks, we see that we need to be forgiven, we need to be sustained, we need help, we need to be cleansed and purified by God. So in summary of this, as, as we, we bring this to a wrap, we see that God, creation just screams out God. You know, I, I think my, uh, my son and his wife, they get used to the yip, 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 yip of the dog. Sometimes we, around something long enough, you just, it becomes numb and you, you don't really notice it. And so I think that can happen also sometimes uh, with our appreciation for God's wonders. So I'm going to say a take home. Enjoy it. Get out there and love it. Secondly, God has graciously given us his word, his perfect word. So our take home is that, cherish it. Study, believe, trust it, and be obedient to it. And then our other take home is we reflect on who we are as people. 
is to keep that repentant and needy heart for God. Let's remember that we need his forgiveness, his sustaining, and his purification. At that point, I'd like just to close in prayer, and then you guys can enjoy your day. Let's pray.